so let's get started. Um, okay, so this piece is really beautiful, but you did something uh, that's a little bit uh, problematic. And what the biggest thing is, um, is you threw the boat right on the horizon line. This horizon line, it's not that, see the thing is when we're kids and someone tells us draw a boat and draw a ship. So we got the boat and we got the water, sorry, and then draw a ship on top of it and then we just go and do something like this. Right? This is still here. This is still happening to you. You think that when something is on top of the water, you have the, the water and then you have the thing on top of the water. That means that you've shared these two surfaces. So in your mind's eye, you still think water and the thing on top. You haven't yet introduced into your mind that in order for something, something can still be on top if it goes lower than the horizon line. So this boat can still be on top of this cube if it's, on, if it's lower than the horizon line. But right now in your mind's eye, when something is on the water, it's just on the top. But that's one problem. That's one possibility. <clears throat> uh, another possibility is that you wanted this boat to be so far in the distance that it's perfectly aligned with the horizon line, which is very unlikely and very um, unique a photograph, and it would actually have to be in the perfect distance. So imagine that there isn't just one horizon line, there's many horizon lines. There's millions of them, just all over the place. And, uh, and these horizon, let me just make a grid as well. Okay, these horizon lines are, are instance and distance. Horizon lines are instance and distance. Please write that back to me or write it down. And what that means is that um, there isn't just one horizon line. If we were a little bit further kilometers down the, down the beach, we wouldn't see this much of the water. So the further away we go, the less of the water we see. Do you understand? So, I mean, it would have to be that this boat, the, the base of the boat would have to be shared in the exact instance of distance with the surface of the horizon relative to us. That means that this boat is perfectly on the line at which the sky starts to happen and the water starts to disappear because of the Earth's spherical shape. So there's nothing wrong with just lowering that boat just a little bit so it feels a little less uncanny, feels less like a trick of the eye or something like that. There's nothing wrong with doing this old little thing right here. You would save yourself a world of trouble and you'd, you'd help your viewers along if you did a little thingy like this. Let me first hear myself see spherical shape. So there's nothing wrong with a sense of echoey fuck and a sense of pompous too. I don't know how you guys are listening to me right now. <laughs> Let me just move this a little closer. Okay. Uh, hopefully I sound better now. Hopefully I'm not too loud. Am I too loud? No. <clears throat> Okay, so what I'm doing now is I'm just lowering this boat. Now it's in the, you know, a little, little further than the background. Some like far mid-ground, I would call it, or, or really far mid-ground, but definitely not. I wouldn't call it background anymore because this boat is such a point of interest. It's got lots of contrast to it. So you have this option, okay? You have this option for, for editing this, this, this painting. You also have another option. Okay, so this is one. You have the option of shrinking this baby. So if it is really on so far in the distance that it's shared the same instance of, of distance, this point of distance of the horizon, with the top of the surface of the water, like the surface of the water, this boat should have been blurrier and smaller. So I've covered the rules of depth many, many times. And one of them is scale. So you've got the fact that one beside the other, these objects don't have any distance in between them. Then you've got the fact that one is higher on the horizon line, so we've done that. And then we've got the fact that they're overlapped and higher on the horizon line, and then they're overlapped and higher on the horizon line and smaller. And um, all of these work together to make the object look more distant. Then you've got atmospheric fade, detail fade, and um, blur. So detail, atmosphere, and blur. All those together, all these three are methods of detailing something. So the blur is the edge work, no edge work. The atmosphere is the contrast, it goes down. And the detail is the last way to detail, remember that? Fine detail. All of these, all these are methods of making something look like it's in the distance by limiting detail, limiting contrast, and limiting edge work. 
And right now you've got edge work, you've got size, you've got contrast, you've got everything telling us that this object should be in the foreground, but it's all the way here in the background. You haven't used scale, and you haven't overlapped either. The, the water line hasn't hidden part of it. I mean, it maybe has. I don't know if this is the earth in the way of the boat, or just the boat in the water. I don't know what it is. Possibly the boat in the water. I'm not sure that, uh, that you would be thinking about the earth in the way of the uh, boat at this time. You haven't used scale, so you haven't shrunk in it, and you haven't overlapped. Uh, you have not, uh, you have raised it along the horizon line, so the boat is in the distance. This is a separate point of distance, like this right here. It's already starting to look far away just because it's on a different point of interest. I mean, point of distance. Okay, but you haven't used the rest of these. When an object goes into the distance, all of these things happen to it. It shrinks, it overlaps behind other objects, it loses contrast, it loses detail. It, um, it goes along the horizon line. So what you need to do is ask yourself, how far away is this object? How far do I want to depict it? If I do want to make it unimportant, this is pretty much the point of interest in the painting. It is the focal point because you've got all this detail. When this boat disappears, you've got nothing but impressionist edges and um, or lack thereof and uh, not just a really high horizon line, lots of body of water and nothing really interesting happening in it. So this boat needs to be in the, in the, in the, like, somewhere over here or something like that. It needs to be over here. That's a point of interest. You've detailed it a lot. It's got beautiful cast shadows on it. <clears throat> so I don't recommend shrinking this boat, but you do have the option of shrinking it. Let me see what I can do. You gotta shrink that baby down. And just put it away in the distance, and that's the only way really that it would make sense with what's around it. Let me use the clone stamp tool to get rid of this stuff. Okay. So this is the only way really to have uh, made sense of that that placement here the fact that this boat is just right on the surface of the water. It had to be far enough that it's that its edge and its bottom, its base of the boat was confused. It can be confused with the surface of the water in the distance. And not just that, but you don't have a clean edge in the distance when it comes to water. You have a very, very specific uh, blur, like a very defined blur on the surface. And there's a lot of atmospheric density near the base, near, near like the, like the, I guess like the close like the hmm, like one kilometer above the surface of the water you've got a lot of a lot of water humidity condensation whatnot so you've got a different like um, a blur of the edges an atmospheric blur happening you don't just make it a clean edge it doesn't just turn into a clean edge if you guys have ever looked at a water a body of water and looked at the edge it doesn't just clean up like that it's very very blurry even on a clear day So I'm just taking care of that. I'm not looking at the questions just yet. I will take questions in a second. Okay, so you've got this option or this option. Uh, when it's far away and close enough, and is uh, close enough, and it's working as a focal point, and one is as far as you suggest that it should be because of its sharing the first surface of a water line. All right. Any questions? You finished the tea. <laughs> Nick, you're going to get shut down if you start talking outside of the um. <laughs> now the boat weight feels way too centered. I mean, there's there's only so much we can do at this at this time, only so much I can do. I like the boat being this far away. Um you've given the water some uh some attention. Something that uh painters usually do with the water is that they focus all their detail attention just on the water. There's nothing wrong with that. So what you can do now is just start showing off the subsurface scattering on the on the on the waves. Right where the right where the water just like uh, the sunlight, the yellowness of the sunlight mixes with the color of the water coming off the sky, and it results in this like green, but it's not a pure green; it's a blue green. So you've got that beautiful turquoise color. So you have that option. I'm just throwing some of that turquoise over here. And the edges of the water are a little bit too too framed at the moment. I feel like they're just too dark. I know you should make them darker, of course, frame a canvas, but they're too dark at the moment. Just 
just going to use light and layer. So when I get rid of these shadows, you really had no detail out here. You had like 100% detail, and then you drop down to like 30% detail or 20%. You're supposed to be radially zooming out. So 100% detail, then 80, and then 70, and then 60. Where here you just dropped out of nowhere with like a cliff of detail and everything just fell off. So you're supposed to be um, adding a little bit more detail, not in this concentration, but just definitely somewhere close to it. Yes, subsurface scattering is a beautiful thing. So in more detail on the edges, those shadows were just high doing only one thing. They weren't really framing that well. We don't even really need framing for this kind of canvas. It's a tile. So you just want to be able to, it's not cinematic anymore, do you understand? So if it was cinematic, it would be like a 1080p 16 by 9 format. It's not cinematic, it's a tile. So you're allowed to break some of the framing and cinema rules. That's why the canvas is successful, even though the, the, the boat is so high up. <clears throat> so one thing I would recommend as well, um, in fact, between these two, I would, just, I would, I would, I would uh, suggest the smaller boat option. If you want to blur it, you can. Shrinking it alone has blurred it somewhat. But I recommend going into all of these little pieces, these little brush strokes, this impressionist its texture, and blurring away at it. And the detail that happens on the surface of the water is um, the foam. That's what gets the detail. So if you want to, you can go over all of these and just make sure that you are treating the foam as the most detailed part of the water. Everything else is very oily. Not oily, but very um, blended. And then just like that, I'm just going to run a quick gesture line of highlight from one edge of the canvas to the next, like a big S. Do you see that? What that's going to do is connect the corners of the canvas together so it's not so empty. And maybe have a little bit of a like a cast shadow relief from one of the uh, one of the clouds to just let go and they have some light shooting through them and some other pieces over here connecting these two corners together you don't want to leave empty corners it's a tile so it's like a the center is always going to be the focal and I'm just gonna do some basic stuff to make sure it's all of my eyes are always on the navigator Okay, so that's just some basic suggestions. Nothing really. The water's too dark for it to be water. It looks like it, there was an oil spill or something. And uh, water is a very reflective surface, so you have all the right to spike the values up into no man's land. As you know, you're allowed to use black and white on areas that require it, so a deep cave or something reflective or a surface reflection or something. So it feels a little bit more like water. I'm already starting to feel better. I'm just going to take a drink of, I'm going to catch my breath and I'm going to take a drink of this water and be right back. I mean tea. Yeah, I agree. The, the clouds look very, very nice. I agree. I really like the clouds. I had no problem with them. If you do decide on the light source coming from any specific direction, you can give the cloud some highlights, but only on the side of the light that that's coming from, and cast some shadows. So some clouds cast shadows on each other. So, oh baby, right over here. I'm sorry, I get really excited because the cast shadows. Cast shadows are just like my, my thing, you know. Some people have chocolates, some people... I don't know. Uh, for me, it's cast shadows. All right. <clears throat> so, right here, this cloud is casting a nice little shadow on this one, and I'm just shit. I'm just uh, inviting this this light motherfucker. I'm sorry. I'm just too excited. <laughs> Son of a bitch. The wrong brush. It's okay. It's okay. Um. Right here, I'm looking at the navigator, seeing how this works out. I'm just right at the very top, so these fluffy little cotton balls. I'm just gonna throw some extra light with this cast shadow here. That's where it's at. Mmm. 
right at the top of this one. This one's kind of relieved from the sh relieved from the shadow. Right at the very top. Mmm, baby, look at that. Holy shit. Subsurface scattering, baby. I'm sorry, I'm just too excited right now. Alright. <laughs> I'm not even looking at the chat. I don't know what you guys are going to be saying. Uh, but I'm using the smudge tool and I'm going to smudge out this cast shadow. Of course, the cast shadow of the fuzzy object uh, will be fuzzy as well. <clears throat> but even cast shadows of, of uh, clouds, if it's, even clouds cast cast shadows. Um, even uh, clouds can stand in the way of other clouds from getting a shadow on them. <clears throat> Alright. <laughs> and you can add some dragons too, so there's that for you. You have that too. Alright. Um, can we get some tips on subsurface scattering of volumetric lighting like in clouds? Uh, with the white tips, doesn't that imply that the waves are breaking? Uh, should we be able to see some of the ground beneath the ocean? Um, it could, it could, I mean, I've seen some, I've seen some green waves and some fluffy waves, um, in the middle of the sea. Like in references, I've seen people take pictures of the middle of the Atlantic and like, a, you know, near some freezing ass glaciers or, or, or just bodies of water and they're just the sun is like nearly sunset or late in the day and you just have that beautiful light shining through it's just if the angle of the wave is in that position or if the light is low in the sky and it's shining the rays right through um the uh yeah elizabeth don't spam or else you're gonna get yeah things that are sexy according to istabrak edges cast shadows and pizza <laughs> You got me in a nutshell, man. <laughs> Since the clouds are gray, shouldn't that reflect a bit on the water? Um, they're so far away, it's hard to tell what's happening, what relationship there is between light and surface, uh, light clouds and surface of the water. Um, if they're very far away, usually what I always do, just by default, I don't even doesn't even I don't even have to prove it, is I just do a little atmospheric fade. There's just so much humidity happening. It seems like it's a summer day. Why else would anyone be sailing? I just throw a big old fog. It's not fog, it's just the distance. It's just the distance, the color of the air, the humidity, all of that in the way. Nothing would be this clear unless it's like a slightly off the shore. But if it's like a massive ship, I would make it even smaller. But if it's a nice humid summer day, then we would have that. The clouds are just a little bit green for my taste. Um, but uh, there could be many reasons why they're taking in that color. It could be a stylistic choice. So as long as you're following your reference, you stay safe. <clears throat> yes, now this work is ready to be framed. Exactly. And yeah, you could add in some dragons. There's nothing wrong with some dragons. Some dragons are, are the shit. Okay, so now I'll just jump into a whole different topic. <laughs> That's the beauty of the community. Anyone can post anything from any kind of study topic. I'm just going to take some tea. Be right back. Okay, so for this this beautiful fella, this just gorgeous fella, um, the nose is just too tiny. The whole head is very very small for the for the, the face is very small on the head. So I would just bloop, just give him some more face time. Ha, face time. I'm so good. I'm just going to rest the ears in between the nose and the, there we go, the, no the nose line and the eye line. Just combine that here. What I do is I just control C, the lasso, and then erase it with soft brush at the edges so it looks like it just seamlessly connected. But the face was just too small, and then the nose was too small. Okay, especially for a male face. Male signatures require a larger nose, the inversion or the squarifying of the triangle of beauty. So you gotta make it like square shape instead of a perfect pretty little triangle. <clears throat> but that nose was a very, very tiny little nose. Okay, so before, after. 
And the edge of the canvas, I'm not sure if you've always been painting the edge of the canvas this small, but you might want to, I mean like this close to the portrait, but you might want to, because the head feels like it flattened out, shit, it flattened out because of the edge of the canvas. You're just really afraid of the edge of the canvas. In fact, add as much space, crop it later. Don't just, um, don't just paint with the same presentation canvas, like make more space available for you. Make it a 10,000 by 10,000 while using only like 3 by 3 pixels, like 3,000 by 3,000 pixels. Because right now the top of the head is a little uh, stunted. And it just feels a little stunted to me. So I'm just going to control C that backward. Okay. Yeah, the head was just a little stunted. And that's the edge of the canvas causing some trouble. <clears throat> Noses are maximum smelling. Noses for maximum smelling. <laughs> ears feel small and too low now. Isabel, please fix. Um, the ears, yeah, they could be a little bit higher. I do agree. And a little bit less visible. Typically, the ears we're just supposed to be seeing like the front piece of the ears, not the whole lobe, or else they'd be um like a high orbit on the ears. So they can go up here just a little. Okay, so go ahead and ask your questions. If you guys have any questions, please keep them relevant. I already answered what my favorite color was. Okay. As for the rest of the face, um, I think your sculpting here on the cheekbones is a little bit enthusiastic. You need to make sure that you have the core shadow set on the face more than anything. And that means the main sphere of the face, all the shadows push towards, oh, push away from the light source. So nothing can be as light on the lower half of the face as anything at the top half of the face. So down here, there should be that beard shadow. The chin has no business being anywhere near contrast level as the nose. The chin has no business that, doing that. All right, the chin can only afford so much contrast, so much further away from everyone and from the light source. It's the farthest little bump, and it's not even a high enough bump to contest the nose. We're building radially every time. Right. The nose right now feels very flat, not enough highlight on it, so what we need to do is, let me show you guys what happens when we flatten the nose, let me open up Portrait Studio. This is what Portrait Studio is all about, ladies and gentlemen, this moment, when I prove to you that I'm right. <laughs> so let me show you real quick. <clears throat> okay, okay. come on then, hurry up. How do you know what color to pick so it doesn't look too dark or too washed? Color or value? How to romance? Master form, cast shadows. <laughs> How to make babies? <laughs> Show your partner you can make some really cool cast shadows. Okay, so I'm going to just lower the bridge of the nose. So this is the side view angle. So I'm going to show you the side view. There we go. And I'm just going to like shrink the nose down all the way. The bridge of the nose is just, there's no, there's no depth. Look what happens. This is what it looks like from the side. Okay. This is a normal, I guess a normal bridge is what we can say. Just like average bridge. This is completely, um, the glabella is like, uh, where is it? There's like no glabella. So that's when we don't have a an extra little shadow here. When we have a normal glabella, a normal everything, we have all those shadows in place. So we have a shadow here. See, there's no highlight here. Squint your eyes. You can see a major shadow in between this highlight and this highlight. We've got a nice, long, beautiful light reflected on the nose bridge. That light disappears when the nose is flattened. So what you're telling me right now with his nose is that there's no light touching his nose. His nose is so flat. And what you did here was you used to depend on value sharing. You see this? This is your day two, this is your day three. All you did was, hey, Isterak said, no, no shadows allowed on either side of the face. Let me just get rid of those. What you're left with is this. This value is the same as this value is the same as this value. So you have two options. You can 
Darken the cheeks, leaving the nose as the lightest point. Oops, that's too much. Okay, you can do that. Now the nose actually feels like it has an elevation. But at the cost of darkening the cheeks, now it looks like he's got like this blush or an extra dark skin. Maybe he has a tan. It kind of looks okay. But we shouldn't darken um, surrounding contrast to build values. We should be always be building lighter to light to dark um, instead of like a... Uh, uh, using the, I mean it just seems backward to darken something that you've already lightened you shouldn't be lightening that much anyway to begin with you should always be working with a darkened midtone and working lighter to uh, always lighter so darkening your values right now is allowing you to um, add as much lights as you want early on all you have to do is darken them down that's not a good way to build up your your spectrum in your mind about how, when to use uh, lights and when to use shadows what you gotta do is Darken the whole piece as a whole. Just everything should be darkened and ask yourself, did I use contrast where I shouldn't have used it? So I'm just going to slightly darken everything. Using a mid-tone, I haven't even darkened anything. Let's look at what I did. Alright? Using a mid-tone. Maybe I'll stop right around there. Before, after. Before, after. Okay. And then I go in. The nose, is, the nose bridge is bright on two, in two ways. One of them is the specularity, so the highlight, that big shiny oiliness that happens on the nose. So the fact that his nose tip can be oily means that his bridge can also reach an oiliness to it. And when I raise this contrast up, I sh I'm basically building an anchor how bright I'm going to go everywhere else. This is why I'm saying don't darken everything just to make it look lighter. Address the fact that this is the highest point now, and then everything should compare to the nose. You're not value sharing on the sides of the nose, so that's good. <clears throat> and now you can build up the cheeks, but they can't be as bright as the nose is because they're not as high or as oily. A little bit on the lips. And if you look at the before, after. Wait a second, I'm not even sure if this is the real before. There we go. Before, after. The ears moved with it, um, felt too small. Face took up, not didn't take up enough space on the head. And then we added some more space at the top. Increase the size of the nose. I need to make a video on noses soon. A whole week just on noses. A lot of you have troubles with noses, and um, it's mostly because uh, my video, the old one, is so old. You guys haven't even seen it in my like recommended or whatnot. And uh, it features Bob and Steve. <laughs> I hate Bob and Steve. <laughs> Stupidest metaphor I've ever come up with in my entire goddamn teaching career. <laughs> So I'm darkening the lower half of the nose just a little bit ex extra. And please don't continue the outline of the nostrils all the way down. Eventually that line combines with the skin of the face. And you don't have that line. You have a slight little indication of the septum. But you don't need all this information down here. The cast shadow is a little too dark. The cast shadow does not belong to the object casting it anymore. And you've got a little bit, as long as the object receiving it and the skin is very light, doesn't allow shadows to drop that dramatically in an open light environment. And then I'm just adding some secondary brightness on the sides coming out of either cheek. You guys also make tiny little baby nostrils. What's with that? Stop with the baby nostrils. This needs to stop. People need to protest against baby nostrils. <laughs> I don't know how that would work out. We need air to breathe. Let them breathe. Let them breathe. <laughs> I don't know what's with the cautious little baby ass nostrils. If you guys are drawing someone who's trying to breathe, you know, a human being with a nose, and you guys give them this tiny little cavity, you're like, check, 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 everything's good, everything's right where it belongs. No. This human being needs to breathe. He needs some space in his nostrils, all right? These are tiny little baby nostrils. No more. Think of Liam Neeson, baby. Alright? He has a beautiful nose. Just 
Give him some big nostrils, all right? Give Liam Neeson the nostrils he deserves. And the nose is upturned, so the nose is turning upward. I mean, this is what's happening to the nose right now. So let's go down to the nose. Upturned. Bloop. Let me tilt the camera towards us. This. this is what's happening to the nose right now. Okay, let me change the lighting so you guys can see a little better. Okay. It's upturned. You're showing a lot of... Look what's happening on the side view. The downturn, of course. <clears throat> so his nose is pointing up just a little bit, but that doesn't mean just because it's pointing up that we have to shrink the nostrils down. No, you, the fact that his nose his nostrils seem big is because you didn't do this initially. His nostrils just took up very, very little space. He just didn't do this. His nostril, his nose just didn't point down, it pointed up. But that doesn't mean you shrink the nostrils down to nothing. Okay? So you can keep them pointed up. You can make them point down. It's your choice. But please give the nostrils some breathing room. <laughs> Literally. Because at the point when nostrils get bigger, people suddenly get scared when they made an ugly pig nose. Yeah. Um... Well, that's why, that's what I'm saying, is that you guys, as soon as you guys incre increase the size of the nostrils, you think, oh, there goes the nose, it's not beautiful anymore. A tiny nose is where the beauty happens. The fact that the nostrils are tiny does nothing for the beauty, it just makes people look weird. Um, you, you can have a tiny nose and have a humongous nostril space, um, because the nose, the nostrils will just flaps. They're still going to look small, they're still going to look tiny. Okay, There's, the nose is still going to look like a nice fitted nose. It does not mean that because I said, okay, make sure you have small noses for a beautiful face, that you give him small nostrils too. <laughs> no more of that. Okay? Baby needs to breathe. Alright, the eyes are a little bit wonky. I feel like, um, just, just for the sake of the demonstration, I'm going to go ahead and just tuck that eye inward. and Make him look like he's focused on something in the foreground. We, when we want to make something look like it's focused, we cross the eyes. That's the only way to do it. Okay, and I'm just going to make the eyes a little bit more focused and symmetrical. I lose my voice very soon. Right now you're working with a symbolic eye shape. Tuck those corners in, okay? We don't need them. I just want to see a circular influence of the sphere of the, the ball of the eye as the as the center point like I don't need to see this long eye but what you're trying to do is cover you hit two birds with one stone you're trying to show this extension of the brow bar bone st structure by increasing the size of the eye you're also working out of a symbolic influence you need a shadow for the lower eyelids as well This whole lower piece, we talked about this before, he's got a male face, so that means that he's got humongous Neanderthal brows, and that means he's going to have, like, these strong shadows under these eyes, under these eyebrows, and a strong shadow here. And then, after you're done all of that, you can bring in the whites of the eyes where you feel like they belong, and only on the swell in the belly of the eye. I'm just going to delete and edit in my new layer. A lot of this was done zoomed out. I'm not I'm trying to make, I'm not, I'm not pretending I can make any of these choices zoomed in. You always need to zoom out into God mode to make these uh, corrections for your work. Even now it feels like his eyes and his nose and his mouth are just taking up very, very little space. Um, it, was just, it was just a bit too careful. They need to be taking up more space on his head. It just feels like everything was too dainty, too small. Maybe you drew, you drew women for a very long time, and your first couple males that you draw are very feminine looking, which is not acceptable. It doesn't matter what social movements are happening outside. A male is a male, a female is a female. For character design, that's very, very necessary. For you to be able to give your commissioner, give your uh, employer a female when they want one and a male when they want one. And so the biggest, uh, biggest difficulty when we're drawing males is fighting off, fighting off our female um, uh, 
uh, like our, our tendency to overdraw females or draw females no, no matter what. There's always always has to be a female in the in the, pro, the portfolio, and that's fine. I mean, my portfolio is full of females. They're more interesting to draw, in my opinion, and all my narratives have a female in them. But it doesn't mean that I every time I draw a male from here on out, I'm going to be making sure that they have female qualities. So there are very specific hormonal and genetic influences that change the that make differences happen between male and female. His face is very cute. But the way to make his face look more masculine, if they were asking you to draw like some really evil um, mercenary dude, and they were, they don't want him to look like a pretty boy. They don't want him to look fuckable. <laughs> they want him to look like he's an asshole, and they want the viewers to hate him. Increase the width of his mouth like that. All right. Bring his eyes closer together. Let me show you real quick what that does. This is what the 14-day challenge is about: making these um, edits on the lab environment. Making sure you're not um, susceptible to any of these symbolic uh, crutches. I'm going to bring this eye closer to this eye over here. Erase. Merge down. Make him look less cute. These are all ways to make him look less pretty. Now he looks like a henchman, right? Now he looks less like less like the protagonist and more like the henchman. Very unfuckable. <laughs> no offense to anyone who has close set eyes. And we haven't even touched the nose. Imagine if we made the nose nice and big and henchman-y. Alright. Big old nose just taking up all that space. Now you just look a henchman who's just mistreating you and he's taking you to the boss. To the big boss man. I mean, the nose is a bit too big now, but it's okay. It's the purpose of the demonstration. So before, very cute, very handsome, very vogue, right? So just remember that. Remember, you need to be able to differentiate between the male and the female face. This eye is just a little far. Just symmetrically, not even beauty distance. It's just far. Right, I'll see what everyone's saying. God help us. <clears throat> Mr. Brock, you need a remaster, remastered video of the Elf and the Ogre video. Yeah, maybe. Um, but the contrast on day two makes it look more 3D and believable in space. No? No. No. Because right now, you ha you do have... A, you, I mean, okay. So, <laughs> I'm trying to say a million things at once. Um, let's see what we can do. La 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 la. Get more of that. Choo 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 choo. Okay. Select inverse. And we can bring in more shadow around his face. We can bring in the shadow that's necessary, like the dark spots necessary where they're needed. So just like just around here, drop those values down. But only on the lower half. Bring in the darkest darks for the pupils. He will look like he's floating in space too. Contrast, if you have that crutch, if you think contrast is 3D, work on it. Find a way to make things look 3D even though you have that contrast, that attraction to contrast. He still looks like he's 3D. In fact, he looks more 3D than the other guy. Just because he has light grays doesn't mean his edge work isn't in place. You're doing very, very well right now with your contrast a beautiful beautiful change in your contrast don't fall for that evil um that voice inside your head that says yo you need more contrast bro just add in some more contrast don't worry don't worry she won't notice just add in some more contrast that shadow there he will still look realistic okay, don't listen to that bro voice it's not there to help you it's just there to fuck up your work Inverse. Showing you, you can bring in pure blacks in here where they're needed. You can darken where it's required. You can still make this look as 3D, if not more 3D, definitely more 3D, than the one before it. The one before it was very contrast dependent. It broke all the rules of value sharing. It was symbolic. It had a halo around the eyebrows. You need like the severe bone structure to make it work. It was too much. 
And this guy, he's got a nice amount of, of contrast, well, only where it's needed. It looks like a 3D model. So you see how I directed all the shadows on the lower half of the face? Because that's light. The light is pointing on the lower half. It's the difference between this and this. You need this. Don't do this. Because this is there's no shadows here. It just looks cheap. Do this. The reflectivity is too high right now. So let me um, take that down. Sorry about the shadow acne. That's um, not acne. The little edge edge problem. That's Unity's fault. Okay. So make sure you don't have that because that's just. I mean that's just too much. You don't have any more cast shadows. And everything nothing is pointing. The, the shadows are not pointing at a light source coming from the top down. They're pointing in the opposite direction of the camera. You need to host some of the shadows. Yeah, this this is this beautiful. It's dramatic. It's great for character. This one's great for character design. This is just odd. It looks very um like a like fireplace. Okay. <clears throat> so before, after. I'm just gonna shut that down. Any questions? It's Rack, but on the contrary, they don't know. It's a Rack, the most videos. Um, don't list your inner dark Kermit the Frog. <laughs> okay, it looks like you can ink that. Yes, more. <laughs> yeah, your inner dark, your inner dark voice. I have a question. What do your inner dark voices say for you? Tell you guys to do in the middle of your painting process. <clears throat> I want to hear what you guys. What what voice? What does that voice say to you guys? I want to hear all of you. Just tell me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so curious what that little voice tells you guys. Elf and the Ogre for next month's challenge, perhaps. Uh, yeah, maybe. I, will, I, do, I did promise lots of polls this year because I just don't like assigning you guys like some sort of dictator um, what to do. Well, I want you guys to vote on it so you can have fun, too. Uh, yeah, you can use transparency layer or cl clipping layer if you want to. Of course, anything that will help you. Make sure you maintain your edges, kid. But yeah, what does your <laughs> yours yours say? <laughs> I'm already laughing. <laughs> Excuse. <laughs> okay, someone says, someone says, put in color. Someone's voice says, put in color. Someone's voice says, mine says, give up sometimes. <laughs> One of them says draw hentai. One of them tells you to restart. Oh my god. One of them is um, more black. Probably to add contrast instead of edges. So bad. Um, tells me to eat shit and not draw again because I suck. Oh my god. Some of these are diabolical voices. I'm not sure if you guys have ever heard of someone called Eckhart Tolle. But he, he actually has like, not anatomically, but... Um, uh, philosophically pointed and called this thing something. He calls it the pain body. It's something that, that, that thrives on your pain. It thrives it's the actual detectable thing about your insecurities or a voice or an inner voice or an inner darkness that once you shine light on it and talk about it, it gets really pissed off and it's trying to get you not to talk about it. Um, you actually feel anger with the more you notice that inner voice of you know that inner darkness. Um, I've always called it the pain body because of him. And I know that voice. I can hear it myself when I when I'm t when I'm painting. It's like this is gonna look like as generic as any other shit you've ever drawn. That's what my voice says all the time. It's gonna look as generic and shitty as everything else you've ever drawn. And um, the, the good voice inside me, that golden white voice that I hear, sometimes tells me, okay, you're gonna draw a lot of generic, sh cruddy shit, but one of these days you're gonna land on something very very unique. So keep going. Um, that's what that good voice inside me says. <clears throat> Mine is to blur everything. Um, why why go for the low contrast? If you paint from real life, you'll have some heavy contrast. Make it anime. <laughs> Use the burn tool. That's what it tells you, Peter. Oh, yeah, I heard that for a long time. <clears throat> a line dependency. Do it. <laughs> Mine says spread the highlights more. Yeah, more highlights. To stop. To just stop. Oh, my God. Don't listen to it. Whatever that voice tells you, don't listen to it. 
Scene's voice says, don't do studies, they're boring. Mine says, you suck, stop trying. Some of these are so diabolical. I just want to find those voices in you guys and just punch them. Buy a pizza. <laughs> oh my god. Soft round brush is perfect for blocking. <laughs> Everything you do looks like shit. Don't blame me. Um, just procrastinate. Mine always says um, either overworked or 10 pounds of shit in a one pound bag. <laughs> oh my god, Sam. Overworked. Delete system 32 and download more RAM. <laughs> Marco. Oh, that's pretty nice. <laughs> one of them is, oh, that's pretty nice. Uh, mine says, what is that? Not really what the heck, what the feck is it you're trying now, dear lord. No, really, what the feck is it you're trying now, dear lord? Oh. Get a Cintiq. <laughs> Make it thick. Use all the lines. My inner voice constantly tells me to troll this rack, and it takes great energies to resist it. <laughs> I don't know, you haven't been resisting it much, Izum. <laughs> focus. Focus, class tower. Please focus on the lesson. Mine tells me to play Overwatch. Oh, yeah. Use soft light. <laughs> soft light layer mode. My god, these voices are diabolical. It looks perfect. Work on it until you ruin it. <laughs> That's true. It looks so perfect right now. Keep working on it until it looks like shit. Oh, I heard that voice many a year. <clears throat> Contrast and chocolate is the meaning of life. <laughs> Don't draw, make memes. If I call it a style, it isn't wrong. It's the right. <laughs> oh, these are beautiful. My art is so good. Wait, what the heck is that? My voice tells me to watch tutorials on YouTube and pretend like you're getting your mileage. <laughs> That's so good, Rosalinda. That's so true. I wish I wasn't so asthmatic. I'm, I'm like, it's hurting to laugh. I don't have enough time. Go to bed early. Who needs to draw? <laughs> I can listen to these all day. It's so true, and it's so funny how all these artists think they're so alone in their journey, but all our inner dark voice is the same thing. And these people who, you know, who hated my drawing suck video, who think I'm harsh with my critiques, so these people have a really loud inner dark voice. Um, it's not letting them uh, believe that they're, you know, bad at something, or they, they refuse to accept it on the outside and the inside, so when someone tells them, hey, this is how you can fix this, hey, pain body, shut the fuck up, you're actually wrong, this person can avoid the contrast by depending on this more, um, it's just, even if the knowledge is there, even if I'm not even being rude, even if I'm not being cruel, um, these people will still find a reason to, to hate my critiques, because it, it, it goes back to that, it goes back to that inner insecurity. So it's not good to listen to that. It's, it's, it's just diabolical. It does nothing for you. So this piece, let's take a look at this one. Um, it uh, has a confusion of contrast. I mean, uh, shit. Confusion of perspective. So this perspective here is telling me this rock, this tree is in front of this tree, which is in front of this one and this one. And suddenly, we enter a three-point perspective. Por qué? How did this happen? When did we enter a three-point perspective? Unless this chair is unusually long and her legs are unusually long, but her upper body is just fine. Her legs should have ended right there, considering that this, this, her legs are just perfectly proportionate to her upper body. Okay, so this was the, um, the, uh, the concept. Mong, that's a really cool name, holy shit. All right, so you 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 kind of made this whole perspective thing happen when really we 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 were just level with the with the throne. Also, you can't just draw a character sitting on a throne, man. Like, let's say you just walked in on a, on a throne room. So a throne room is designed to just um you know to meet with your subjects and talk to them. So it's like a ceremonial chair more than a practical chair. Um, really, I mean, what, what are you gonna? There's no table nearby. You're just sitting down. Someone's got to look up and watch you. So as an illustrator, as someone who's designing a scene, all right, let's say we're panning cinematically, and we started in the cameras this wide, and we're just panning upward, and this queen is talking to her minions. Where are the minions? Draw some shadows, whatever, just, just silhouettes. I need something, something to tell me that this is a throne room. When you're an evil spirit or a forest spirit, not necessarily evil, you don't just sit on the throne and wait for shit to happen. You're usually walking around doing shit. 
Um, so what, what's, what's happening here is I'm just, I just feel awkward. I'm just like, okay, so what, we're going to talk to each other now? It's like you walk in on an interview and they're just sitting on the chair not saying anything. There's a relationship right now between the sitting character and me. And it's just awkward silence right now. And something needs to tell me there's something happening here. So maybe a silhouette of some people. Maybe this person is sitting. Maybe they're sleeping and their head is tilted. That would make way more sense than her sitting alert, zoning out into space. So maybe if she's asleep, maybe she's just a sleeping titan. Fix the legs first, of course. And throw them off in the distance. Maybe shrink her a little bit. Distort her. Give her a shadow. Um, she's so illuminated. It's like when you shine a light on someone on stage, they're about to say something. So what is she about to do? There's nobody in the room. Nothing is happening. She can't just sit there and run the world and run the forest and run the dark forest just sitting on her butt. Something has to happen here. So you could have had a character, you know, kind of just uh, ready to kind of kill her or some shit. You could have a group of people. You could have her talking to her senator or some stuff like that or talking to Trump, telling him what next to do and what other bills to pass and shit like that. Draw his little stupid ass fucking comb over. I cannot believe he's just hasn't fucking gotten rid of that fucking comb over. Um, I don't know what to say anymore about his hairstyle. It's just he's chosen it and that's it. His parents told him. His parents built his ego way too much. Shit, has he ever looked in a mirror? For the love of God almighty. Um, but yeah, she's just telling Trump what executive order to pass next and um, there has to be something happening here between these two characters or between these characters, or between these three characters, or else this whole canvas um, is making no sense at all. That, along with the perspective issue and the staging, you have a, horizon a vertical canvas for a horizontal scene. This is not a character design setup. If I was trying to show off this character, I would crop it like this, and that would be perfect. Um, but I'm not cropping in that way. What I'm doing here is I'm showing a landscape, so what I need to do to make this landscape happen, to make it really make sense, is cut this. When I do that, it becomes really beautifully cinematic and inviting, and we can see, okay, so that's why it made no sense. What is she looking at? It's not a character design. It's not really a book cover. Why show off in full light the villain of the book cover or the protagonist? I mean, the protagonist maybe, but in this kind of lighting setup, <clears throat> so what you got to do is, first of all, if she's not about to say anything, and if she's asleep on her throne, or if she's become a stone, or if there's like a hundred years light time span before the next time she speaks and starts wandering around, and this is where you can f find her sleeping away, cast some shadows on her so that she's not, we're not expecting her to say something. All right, so just like that weird Sith Lord dude, remember that weird uh, dude from Star Wars? He was always in the shadow, always shrouded. But when he was about to say something, it was just a little bit of light thrown on. So the top of her head, all of that is getting thrown into shadow. And we're only getting some areas that are illuminated. And it's just expressing that. Okay, now she's in the distance. Now she's just sitting there. Maybe she's turned to stone. If I want to make her look like she's not live, like it's just um, she's out of commission, I'm going to just grab some of the environment color and just toss it on top of her. I don't want to make her look like she's about to move. She's about to do something or say something. All right, so this cinematic lighting is required when you think about a cinematic, like when you start with the cinematic uh, framing. But if you had to, had to, had to keep this for a book cover or something, this exact framing, you got to find a way to match this character with its environment. you got to make sense of what's happening. Can't just make a character design and then just drop it into any kind of environment. There has to be a narrative, always. Write that back to me. There's always a narrative. Somehow, some way, in some weird way, there's a look how long those legs are. They don't need to be that long. There's always, always, always a narrative. the light is coming from above, then there might be some light here in the foreground. And that light in the foreground, what it's doing is um, it's setting up a stage. So maybe there's a character looking at her. Maybe someone found her. And then you can add the little senator dude talking to or reporting about the dark masses that they've, I don't know, God, I don't know. Maybe you have some priests 
and you have to cast in some beautiful long shadows. Really tiny people for scale, you know, just having like a tiny little person here. Just to show how they're like uh, swarming around her. Okay, you can do all kinds of stuff with this. Just don't make someone sitting down in three-point perspective for no reason on a vertical canvas. It's such a beautiful concept. And they wouldn't just have all this light shining on them. Again, it's like this re really weird, awkward, awkward light source. Everything else is in, is in uh, this kind of light source. But she's just in this kind of light source. Like she had only one light, like there was one light bulb or FUD light de dedicated to making sure she has no cast shadows on her. So it canceled the cast shadows of everything around her. Which is not possible. The environment light source comes first before anything. Right, so any questions on this illustration? <clears throat> now it looks like a shrine. I mean, if it's a throne room, I already would have suggested add in some, some, some servants, some minions, something. There has to be a narrative. It doesn't just sit there. It doesn't just happen. Okay, so let's see what anyone wants to say. Burn the art witch. <laughs> So if I submit work for critique now, will you get a chance to do it today? Um, I'll do it either way, just checking. Um, probably not, Bernardo. I'm sorry. Um, it's already uh, 5.58. Emperor, per, Emperor Propel... <laughs> I can't say it. Emperor Palpatine. Yes. <laughs> Sith Lord, dude. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't know if he's a Sith Lord. Um, Palpatine. I'm not a guy. What? <clears throat> she's ass blasting I'm not ass blasting anybody I'm making sure that you guys remember how important these rules these rules are more important than me and I'm their agent right now I'm their field agent and that they come first before I do it has nothing to do with me and who I am and me just stroking my ego telling people what physics is I'm stroking like nature's ego right now Yeah, I feel small and secluded for a throne room. That's why I feel like it's like a hibernation room or she's just like out of commission. She's just fallen asleep or this is where she goes to contemplate existence. But even then, a throne room has no practicality at all. Like as a chair, it's just a chair in the middle of nowhere. Someone has to be there to sit that, look at that person while they're sitting and just watch them while they're sitting on the chair doing whatever it is that chair is meant to do, which is signify their importance. So this chair is signif signify their importance. So what's happening? Why are they so important? Important people are swarmed by servants. So where are the servants? Um, and how do I make her look more important? How do I make the scene come first? Light environment always comes first. So let's throw some cast shadows. Let's have some light come out of some really, really strong no man's land values. Just have that. Just mm. Look at that. And let's cast some shadows, dude. Oops. Darker, darken, cast some of that. Just bloop. Let's just darken. Let's just make this light the king of the painting. Even more important than this than this lady. Okay. And just have some rim light. Touch everything on the sides. Sorry about the soft brush. And then there, this could have been one individual scene between like a a wanderer who's like ready to ta like attack this lady. I don't know. Give me a second. Maybe he's like he's climbing and he's just like, "Yo, is this lady asleep?" Type of deal. And he's like, "What's happening here?" All right, something's happening here, right? There has to be something happening. This is what I recommend. And then just like hiding behind there. He's like ready with his like sword or his bow or something. I don't know. Okay, that's all wrong. He's got a sword and he's got like his his horses coming behind him. And he's ready to consult with the witch of the forest or something. There has to be something happening. Okay, so those are my recommendations before after light environment comes first the scene comes first the camera comes first and then everything else so any questions let me go read make sure you write my name with the question or else I don't find it 
Why is soft brush bad? It's not bad, it's just it gets rid of your edges. If you've been working um, really hard on your edges, you won't be able to. <clears throat> is the artist trying to show off the character or the environment? The environment comes first. The light environment and the foliage, the surrounding the earth comes first before the character. If this is a character design lineup, of course the character comes first and the environment comes second. Um, but but in this case that wasn't. You decided to bring it into a, into a scene. That scene comes first. The camera comes first. The, the sun comes first. The sun comes first. If it says that this humongous perfectly um, designed being is in a shadow, there's there's I don't care how important this character is. I don't care how much time you spent designing them in a character design concept or a lineup. The light will always cast a shadow where it belongs. The geometry comes first, the, the, the scene comes first, the cinematics come first, always. Then the character, the stage, and then the actors. I know you're not ass blasting. I'm really thankful for uh, that you're helping me. Thank you, Philippa. I'm happy you don't <laughs> haven't demonized me yet. I don't know. Give me some time. We've got like two minutes left. <clears throat> Wouldn't it be better if the light were coming from the sides, pointing at the subject like a spotlight? I mean, it just depends on how this person decided to, where the light is in the environment. Behind them seemed very, very nice and dramatic. They were naturally cast in some shadow and some, some tiny little uh, light on the sides. The sun comes first, yes. <clears throat> I'm sorry? I'm sorry, generic art, what do you mean? <laughs> is the artist trying to show the character? Do you think I should have painted her darker because of the light coming from behind her? I really struggled with the. I think how dark I made her was just enough. Um, you still have to make her look important, but you have to cast some shadows. And uh, if she has glowy eyes, glow those eyes, man. That's really important. If the, her, her eyes are natural secondary light sources, then just glow them around. But make sure they're not as bright as the primary light source. Question. I'm terrible with line art and I don't really want to do it. But I want to do commissions. How do I show sketches to my customer when I draw sculpturishly? How do I sketches? How do I show sketches to my customer? Um, you mean well, I don't understand. Do you want to show your customers line art or, or clean sketches? Just make sure that your first layer, which is your gesture lines, is lowered in opacity. Your shapes are lowered in opacity. Your general sketching is lowered in opacity, and that you have this really messy but really low opacity layer and then you've got your lines on top. Let's see if I have an example. This is what I usually do. I'm going to see a butt in a second. I'm sorry parents who recommend myself. <laughs> I'm just showing some asses. Okay, but let me show you guys what these lines look like, what these, what these sketches look like underneath. So this is the line art on top, right? Let me show what this shit look like. Come on. <laughs> All right, this is how this shit started. So if you're making, if this is, if this sketch amount is in this, I mean, if this uh, stage of the sketches is in this high opacity, something went wrong. You need to lower that shit all the way down, and then have your um, your stuff on the top. Okay, I lower it down all the way because I don't need it anymore. It did its purpose and it and it did its stuff and that's it. Okay, so that's uh, commissioners would love that stuff. You know, that way you can go back and edit your 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 stuff, and then you um you're still not submitting cr like the crappy early stages, which we all have. It doesn't mean it doesn't matter how advanced you are. You're still uh, dicking around, using some rough lines, um, experimenting, going crazy, having fun. Once you're done deciding on the you know, gesture line and the and the bend of the spine and the major weight distribution and the center of mass and how believable this figure is or this portrait is, then you go on and follow with some clean lines. And in order to use clean line or to have clean lines, you can't, you have to count your lines. If you've used more than 200 lines for the final line stage, for the final layer, something went wrong. Um, you have to start counting your lines make sure I'm not going to go over 50. I promise myself I'm not going to go over 25. For sure, for sure, I'm not going to go over 10 for this simple arm sketch or the simple face portrait sketch. If you're using lots of lines um, and you don't have any background stuff, it's you're trying to do something only pros can do. And when I say pros, I mean like 40-year-old pros. And even then, like 30-year-old pros. You know, if you're so early and you're, they haven't even mastered anatomy yet or thinking about anatomy and already trying this stuff, it's a little dangerous, okay? <clears throat> it's Portrait Studio. You can buy it from Mr. X store on her website. Oh, yeah, yeah. This is Portrait Studio. You can do all kinds of shit. 
but it's good for reference making. So I'm going to be working on a side up, up, like a high view, let me low view, looking up kind of deal tonight, hopefully, while listening to some Hobbit. So what we've been doing lately is we've been, uh, in my stream, I've been just playing some Hobbit audiobook while we all sketch together. Anyway, if you guys want to join us. But yeah, this is a, just me setting up. You can move the neck, they can choose on the, you can change the portrait features, the character, the gender, um, you have some form study shapes, reflectivity, you have control over the light and the camera. Um, it's all available on my website. Um, that's Portrait Studio. It makes a great Valentine's Day gift. <laughs> um, is, is there any way, so, any solid way to move my line work from traditional to digital? I can paint in digital, but it feels so unnatural for sketching. You just gotta bite the bullet, Crow. Um, it's it's just the hand-eye coordination. You gotta get your hand used to the tilt of the of the tablet, the position of your keyboard. Uh, you can, I mean, if some people think, hey, I'm going into digital. Let me go buy a two thousand dollar, three thousand dollar Cintiq. It'll make the transition much easier. It's not gonna make the transition easier. You're still gonna be dealing with that learning curve. Um, and if you can't afford, most of us cannot afford a Cintiq. Uh, you're gonna have to just settle for a basic tablet, and um, bamboo is very, is really, really good alternative. It's got no buttons on the side to annoy you. Um, that's the one I'm actually gonna be rewarding. And uh, and then you can just just start working on it. Just start sketching. Don't listen. You gotta let yourself suck. Okay, just sit there, open up a canvas, three th three thousand by three thousand, three hundred three hundred whatever. And just start, just let yourself suck, man. Just let yourself not be good. It's okay. Not every line you lay down has to be perfect. Have some references. If you don't want to work with references, fine. Just start sketching something because you need to get your hand used to this new environment. And uh, this new learning margin is going to decrease your skills significantly. But just remember, this is not a reflection of what your skills currently are. You're drawing much better than you do digital, traditionally, right? So that means you still have that knowledge in your brain. You just have to let the digital and your hand and the whole new environment catch up with what's inside your brain already. Just give it some time. Don't lose hope. Don't say, oh, shit, I forgot all my skills. You didn't. You're always going to be improving. The more you live, the just living, just, just living makes you learn better. Um, or uh, no more. Um, just enduring one extra day. Uh, so just give it some time. You will get over that learning curve and your skill will catch up. <clears throat> just show up to your canvas. That's it. <clears throat> How do you get to yourself to stop being lazy? That has nothing to do with art. That has that that has everything to do with your personal growth and what, your relationship with work and discipline and your relationship with what it means to work every single day. So you're gonna have to ask yourself: Do I clean? Am I a clean person? Do I do I do my chores? Do I do my homework on time? Am I a le generally lazy person? Do I do I yeah, am I lazy in every way? Or is it just art? Something I'm, is there's something I'm afraid of about art. Have I discovered that I have a line dependency, and dependency, and am I am I too scared to tackle it? Um, do I avoid taking a shower every day? Do I work out? Am I that kind of? You have to ask yourself: Is it this art specific laziness, or is it just who you are right now? And you got to work on that part of yourself. We're not perfect. None of us are perfect. We all have a tendency to be lazy and procrastinate, and that will affect how good we are. So just think about it this way: All those amazing artists are amazing because they have a great work ethic and they have amazing discipline. So if you're not their character, um, like if you have that character flaw, that's one big disability you're going to have to deal with as you as you progress. <clears throat> I have been using the pen tool primarily. Do you find uh, you use the mixer brush or smudge tool very much? Um, no, I, I to blend what I do with the primary stages of blending. I uh, I just blend normally, and I think blending using the alt tool is the biggest crutch. It's the lowest. Uh, um, uh, comparable, I guess it's lowest in comparison to what we can do tra traditionally. Traditionally when we blend we smudge. That's why I depend more on smudging. But in Photoshop we just have this all this amazing new tool called Alt and we can just choose the color right there and just keep blending. And, and in traditional when we want to blend two paints sections together we use a dry brush and we smudge. We're always smudging to blend in traditional. That's why I'm sticking mostly to, to smudging. That's why I tell my friends to smudge. That's why I tell my students to smudge. Because it is the easiest equivalent. And it makes you think more in the traditional mindset than the digital mindset. Digital, sometimes, of course, is very useful to use the alt tool and, um, and use the color picker and then just smudge and blend that way. Um, but uh, 
for me, I think I found a balance. Early stages, that block in. I'm not really blending. Late, later on, the mid, like the, around the middle section of the painting process, um, I, I would use the Alt tool and the color picker to blend. And then later on, when I'm really trying to get that realistic, smudgy look, I, uh, I just smudge away. I don't depend on that uh, strictly digital method of blending. Um, <clears throat> Isarak, how long should a person initially do master studies? How long should a person, um, what do you mean? How long should you wait until you do a master study? Uh, just try like one every six months and that's it. Everything else should be studies. A master study is like, uh, studying your, um, it's like studying the, the, the way that specific artist chose their specific colors specifically and that specific painting specifically. Um, it, you're just, you're not learning about physics when you, when you watch their art, uh, when you study their art. That's, you're learning about their color choice, you're learning about their technique, their texture, um, their, the, the, the anatomy that's repeated between the paintings, their subject matter. Uh, you're learning about that specific artist in that moment. Um, and that's... You should do those if you feel like you're at a loss for what to do subject matter wise. If you're at a loss, um, how I would want to just curiosity. You want to see how other artists have executed different kinds of techniques and what that technique, what what you what, what results they yield. Um, but master studies should not be prioritized over photo studies and studying physics and studying reality and studying light and studying rotation and symmetry and geometry. Those should be prioritized. You should teach your brain to rotate a cube before you master um, or, or observe or study the way um, Singer chose colors. <clears throat> Who takes a shower every day? I do! <laughs> uh, oh man, this is big enough to get sub beggars hype. Uh, what's that? What's a sub beggar? Where should I start on form drawing? Uh, people always say look into anatomy and online resources, but that's kind of vague. Um, form drawing, I mean form studies? Uh, start with Bern Hogarth. Let's just say that. Let's start with Bern Hogarth and see how he how he minimizes the anatomy of a of an arm into this lowest lowest poly version, and he gets this really geometric looking arm, and then he studies it as a geometry instead of an arm, and that way when he goes back to a realistic arm reference, he can break it down in his mind, see the core blueprints of the geometry in front of him. How did you get all that knowledge? I can't find a concept art university in London. You're not going to find one, Quantum. Uh, which I'm so jealous of you, by the way, that you live in London. I hate you. I wish I was you. Um, but uh, to, there's so much. Uh, there's so many resources online right now. There's so many channels online. Just focus on get a day job if you want to. If you live with your parents, it's really lucky for you. If they're okay with you living with them, really, really lucky. Just focus on your craft. Uh, teach yourself. Be self-taught. No matter what, I mean, unless, unless you're going to an atelier, and ateliers are expensive and they're far away and they require relocation most of the time. Um, but if there's one nearby you, I think there's some ateliers in London. There has to be some ateliers in London. Um, but yeah, just try to find some. If you can't find some, just study at home. And basically meaning that you uh, follow what everyone else is doing in the community, which they're prior to prioritizing their form studies. They're working in grayscale. They're doing photo studies. They're mastering their portraiture. The portrait is the spine or one of the major spines of your portfolio. Being able to paint a face beautifully speaks like volumes for a, por for a portfolio. And, um, and just, uh, just go from there. That's exactly what you would be doing in an atelier anyway. <clears throat> Can you show me how you blend with smudge tool and what brush, please? I have a hard time. I don't have time to do a demonstration right now, but usually what I do is a scatter brush. Uh, if you want Seraphim, Seraphim, um, you can upload uh, your blending samples. Upload some blending samples on the community. If you don't know where the community is, you just got to go to isterac.com. Okay, isterac.com, go to Google+. Plus. And just upload here. And just upload some, some blending samples. Show us how you blend and we'll talk about it there. All right, I'll look out for your post if I have time and I'll just, uh, you know, maybe we can discuss where you are currently in blending so that we can work from there. Isabrak, is there a ne recommended next step for a 14-day challenge? Yes, three-quarter view. 
Everything you think you know about painting a front view face changes when you try it after quarter view. So I challenge you to take on the 14 day challenge, the 14 day march of shame <laughs> um, into the three quarter view world, into the realm of, the, of darkness, into the elephant graveyard of three quarter view and see what you can do. Question, why is the username Isterak? Because that's my name. It's my real name. It's not a tag name or a nickname. <clears throat> uh, but can this make it harder to learn how to use the tablet when I buy it? Um, I've been trying to use mouse since I don't have a tablet. Clara, do you have a phone? Clara, do you have a cell phone? And what kind of cell phone do you have? Ethan. <laughs> yes, it means milkweed, golden milkweed from heaven. It's the stupidest name in the fucking world. <laughs> Thank you, challenge accepted. <laughs> Go for it, let's see what you can do. <clears throat> I'm still waiting on Clara's answer. Let's just wait for Clara's answer. How does one participate? You just start. You just start. <laughs> Cell phone hacker brack. Basically where I'm going at, I'm not getting any answer from Clara. If you have an iPhone like 5 and higher, if you have like a Samsung 6 and higher, if you have a tablet at home, if you have at least a 60 inch or 50 inch, um, not 60, 50 inch or 45 inch television in your house, most surely you can afford a $60 tablet off Amazon or eBay. There is no excuse for why you don't have um, a, a tablet. And um, if you're young, if your parents are really, are really low in income, if there is absolutely no chance for you to get a tablet, keep doing what you're doing. It's tablets for like $60. Again, we did go to Amazon together. And we looked up, um, okay, Wacom tablet, $85, $79. I'm not talking about these humongous, this one's garbage, it's already peeling. The little plastic on this side is peeling, um, so don't get that. Look at this, $86. You don't even have to have the medium, you can get the, you can get the, um, the small. $59, holy God in heaven. I wish I had this, I wish they were this cheap when I bought My Graphire 4 was $140 when it came out a long time ago. That was my first tablet. <clears throat> Look at this. It's $69. You guys, it's not as expensive as you think it is. If you talk to your parents and explain to them, hey, this is a very important tool for me. It is a progressive tool. It'll help me draw. There's absolutely, like, this tool doesn't even have internet on it, so I'm obviously not going to waste time on Facebook using this tool. This is an app. This tool is the beginning and the end of it. Rasa Mitsase um, is all about art, okay? It's not going to be, um, and it's not going to be a distraction thing. It's just specifically about art, and I really want this tool. Your parents can find sixty dollars if you can wait three months and collect twenty dollars every month. You don't go out to the movies. You save it. There's always ways. There's always going to be a way to get yourself a tablet. These are cheap. I'm sure your parents maybe have a credit card. If not, you can get that money and get a temporary credit card and use it to buy this on Amazon. You can get those temporary ones where you can prepaid credit cards. There are ways, okay? Back then, <laughs> my brother found ways to get shit online. He would just figure his whole way around credit cards. He would save for six months and buy this, like, game. I don't know. My brother was just, he, he showed me the truth. If you save up, you can, your parents don't even know they're giving you hundreds of dollars. And as far as they're concerned, they think they're giving you five dollars. If you really count how much your parents are giving you, probably enough more than enough for two it's probably enough for two tablets so please um uh yeah just give us some time and save up some save up your money and uh, on ebay it's even cheaper than amazon and we're talking about that like, this is brand new out of the box on ebay you have some used stuff which is the equivalent of like this one or i mean i mean this one right here for a lot cheaper or half the price of that and it's much bigger <clears throat> Israk, you say don't do masterpieces so fast. Did you mean like don't complete pieces often? When should we do a complete drawing? When I say masterpiece, I mean turning a study into a full illustration, adding clothes, hair, and a monster in the background, and a pet 
and uh, and some sky and some clouds. That's what I mean. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter about your masterpiece. What matters is that you finish this study and you went on to the next one as soon as possible. If you if you wait from masterpiece to masterpiece, you're looking at like a three month period between the next time you start something and finish it. Um, so masterpieces delay how often and the quantity at which you complete your pieces. If you gray it out and make it a study and remove the creative pressure and the sentimental value of each study, then you end up uh, you know creating more and getting more mileage under your belt per year. Okay, I, th I think that's good. Um, what tablet does Isarac use? I use a really old piece of shit. <laughs> Wacom Intuos 5 uh, Touch. I hate the buttons. I always will hate the buttons. Thank you everyone for coming today. I will see you guys on Tuesday. Um, the challenge for uh, the floral humanoids is due on the 21st, so please get to work on them. You should probably start rendering around the 14th, but right now if you still have some concepts and sketches, upload them uh, before the 14th preferably so we can revise them and um, Make sure your concepts are in, are in order. I will do the critique hour for the floral humanoids on the 21st. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. Have a great day, guys. Bye.